going here. I'm going to mute everybody because we got some background noise for right now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday Notary Titans for Tuesday, August 13th. Uh, today, uh, I'm, my, my name is Bill Soroka. I'm the founder of NotaryCoach.com and the Sign and Thrive Notary Training Course and Community. I'm here with my co-host, Laura Buer from CoachMeLaura.com. Laura, hello and welcome. Thank you for being here. And of course, Carol Ray, founder of Notary2Pro is with us. Carol, how are you today? She's muted. Let me unmute her. How are you, Carol? Oh, where'd you go? Carol, we should be able to hear you now. No. Carol, we lost you. Can you say something? There you go. <laughs> I had to unplug my microphone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Got this fancy microphone and you can't hear out of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you guys for being here. I know you're uh, extremely busy and I really love and appreciate that you take so much time for uh, fellow notaries. I know like you, I really enjoy this weekly Tuesday Notary Titans call. So we're going to jump in. We have some amazing questions. We have a great presentation from Laura on the correction of notarial certificates. Uh, first, before we do that, Laura, what are you excited about today? Well, I'm excited because I am once again another great aunt. My youngest brother in Florida uh, just had his first grandchild. Her name is Grace, and uh, it was great timing uh, that his daughter, um, Tori, had uh, this little girl, and I'm just very excited, and I can't wait to see pictures. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Carol, what are you excited about this week? I have a couple of things, but first of all, I want to apologize to everybody. Last week when we were on, my phone kept ringing and I got really irritated because almost every one of the calls were those stupid spam calls. And I can't, I don't know how to shut my ringer off on my phone. So I, and then the dog was barking and Bill was behind me. So welcome to my life. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am really excited this morning because we have a guest. And I'd like to introduce him if it's time now. Is that all right? That's exactly perfect timing. Yep. Okay. Uh, this, this man is uh, the brother of my beautiful uh, daughter-in-law of 30 years. I've known him all of that time. And he's just a terrific man. He lives down in Southern California. He actually owns an auto repair shop. He's been in that business for years and years. And he's about to embark on his career as a notary signing agent but the most important and wonderful thing that he has done and it started a year ago I can't believe that we started to do this a whole year ago we started a, a course to take notary to pro the full version and translate it into Spanish because I felt that it was an important thing for people who speak Spanish their native language to have that ability to learn that way so this is Lalo Garcia, and uh, I'm going to tell have him tell you a little bit about what he's been doing with this, and he's been working really, really hard on it, and I'm very proud of what he's done. So, so good morning, Lalo. Well, good morning, and may God bless everyone. Uh, yeah, it's an exciting thing that we've been doing. Um, yeah, it's been a year. It's been a year, but uh, a good journey. The results are going to be well worth it. But uh, what we're doing is we're still in the process of uh, translation, but we have finished the notary signing agent course. We just finished the advanced course and um, I'm getting started on the reverse mortgage. So we're looking forward to getting that done. But yeah, it, uh, transition is, uh, is happening. You know, as, as Carol said, I've been in the automotive business pretty much all my life. And I have my own repair shop at the city of Orange. But what is going on is, is I'm uh, planning my exit strategy from the shop. And my brother is my partner. I'll eventually just transfer everything over to him. And I am in the, in the process of uh, setting up for the notary signing agent. I have already got my commission, already got my bond, already got my insurance. 
and I'm just, I'm actually in the process of setting up my office so that I can get started with this uh, this venture. Um, everything is going smoothly, except as as it happens, life happens. Things get in the way, so so you know our our plans take a little longer than we expected. Uh, when Caroline first started this, we were planning on having this done in a matter of months, but uh, it's taken a little longer than we expected, but it's turning out really, really good. I uh, find that the things that take the most time, or the things that are most worthwhile take the most time sometimes. Right, Lalo? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you know what? When, when you really, really get emotionally connected to something, you wanna make sure it's done right. You know, it's not just a slam bam, get it done. So it's, uh, it's really important that this get done correctly. And the beauty is that anything that, that is on that uh, course, as we, we go along, if there's any type of uh, adjustments necessary, they can be done. So we're, we're, we're going okay. So um, I, as, I'm sorry, go right ahead, I'm, I cut you off. Go right ahead. No, no, I just wanted to talk about the importance of, of bilingual training because in this industry, you know, it's very important that things do not get lost in translation. So when there's a, uh, someone that's going to go out to, to a, a customer's house who only speaks Spanish, you want to make sure that you have the proper verbiage to be able to explain to them. We want to make sure they understand what they're signing. And I believe that, um, that, that, being able to train in both languages, again, nothing gets lost in translation. So your question? Yeah, that was that my, my question was, I see tremendous value in this. And I love that Carol took this on again, kind of um, blazing, the, blazing the trail ahead on this. I know so many of us on this call today probably have um, friends, associates, uh, customers that have asked how they can um, get into training. And <clears throat> can you speak to the value of learning to do this business in, a na in their native language so they can do it out in the field and how well, pe we, people can get involved? Let's agree that it cannot be just the, 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 the second language. We have to have a base of English. Okay, so um, anyone who is in the business that has taken the English course can jump off from that. But for, for Spanish speaking only, or any other language only, there's got to be English involved here, okay? Documents, uh, pretty much everything, it, you know, it, it, it's base is English. But the beauty is, is that if you train in, in, in Spanish, when you are talking to the customer, you already practice the, the verbiage, the, the jargon uh, of the industry. And you're, you're able to, to use the proper words. One of the things that I've noticed that um, I've communicated with people all over the country um, where I ask, how do you use this term in your part of the country? And I've come across some different, different ways of saying the same thing. So the beauty is, is that, that we've compiled four or five different words for the same idea. So what I want to do is incorporate those different terms back into the training so that whoever is taking the training, wherever in, uh, they are in the country, they have that, uh, that understanding that that word correlates with the base word. So it's really important that we were able to explain and communicate so that people understand. Absolutely. And I think, and I think and you have found this too, but I think the, the Spanish speaking community has been underserved in many, many states. And there's a tremendous opportunity here for notaries who want to work within that community to really dive in and recruit help for this too. I love what you're doing here. If people want to find out more information, where can they go? Well, they can go to Notary to Pro Spanish and um, uh, everything's going to be right there all in one. We, we do have a, um, a Facebook page also. And all, all the links are, are, are on, the, um, on the home site. So we can be able to get all the information necessary. 
And one more thing that's exciting is, is that, uh, you know, Carol uh, has asked me to also become a mentor for, uh, for the Spanish site, which I'm looking forward to. So as soon as uh, all, all the translations get done, there's gonna be questions. So, you know, Lord willing, I'm gonna be available to be able to answer those questions for everybody. Well, that's going to be a very rewarding component of your life, I'm sure. I love it. I love your personality. I love your attitude and the energy that you're going to bring to the industry. Well, thank you very so much. much. And I did post a link in the chat, uh, guys, for notarytoprospanish.com. So you can check that out and get the links to the other sites as well. Carol, thank you so much for bringing Lalo on. I know you guys have worked so hard on this. I can't wait to see where Oh, he has worked hard. And I just want to add one thing. This is how this all started. Uh, Arizona now, I believe, requires translators. But when in those bill, uh, days when Bill and I did signings in Arizona, we did went into a lot of Spanish-speaking homes. And I don't speak Spanish at all. Uh, I found it heartbreaking in a way because we oftentimes depended on the family's children. I would have a, an eight-year-old translating things to the parents because they didn't speak any Spanish at all. That's where that formulated this whole idea of this it took years for it to pop out <laughs> thank you lalo thank awesome. you everybody thank you, lalo thank you carol all right guys we have a lot of great questions and today i want to start with live questions but before we do that i would love it if laura uh dove in to the how to correct notorial certificates and all the little nuance around that you bet um there are quite a few episodes where <clears throat> people were asking uh, either about how to do that or were indicating they were asked to do it and thought it was illegal to do it. So there's just a lot of um, unknowns about um, I, can I do it? If I can do it, how do I do it? Does my state specifically give me direction? So let me share my screen. I love presentations. And let me just see. I can get to it here. Mm -hmm. That looks like it right there. Let's see if I can. Yeah, looks like we're up. Okay, looks like we're good. We are good. Yeah, we see everything now. I'm always excited when technology works the first time. Right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, most people know who I am. I'm Laura Bewer. I'm with Coach Me Laura. That's uh, one of the businesses uh, that I'm in, and, and I privately coach people, either in general, notary work, um, mock signings uh, at the table for those who need practice, uh, and then I speak for conferences and events. Now, I also have at your service, which means I'm out like everybody else doing the work. So which states allow for corrections? Because not everybody's California, right? Uh, thank goodness. So 35 states do not even address corrections in their statutes, so what I'll talk about are best practices to be used. 13 states have provisions to correct a notary certificate with some kind of direction. One state, can you guess who, says forget about it, no way, that's illegal. And then um, one state, that's the other one, um, doesn't address it in the statute, but the Secretary of State has a directive that says absolutely no can do. So let's break this down a little bit. Let's just take the two that are an issue. In Florida, there's a statute and it says a notary public may not amend a notarial certificate after the notarization is completed. End of sentence, end of story, that's the whole deal. So if you're in Florida, you're not allowed to fix those certificates once they've left and they're being rejected by say title or lender uh, for whatever reason, you need to meet with the signer again and do the whole notarization again, as if you never did it the first time. And there's just no way around it. Hmm. California is interesting because the law does not address corrections, but the Secretary of State has the ability, and they do in any state, to interpret or give a directive that they believe supports where the law is vague. And uh, so you will find in um, that there's no provisions in the law uh, other than, you know, at the table it's fine. Uh, but if you discover an error in the Notarial Act after completing 
then you should notarize the signature again, including attaching a new certificate and a journal entry. And if you're in California, I just want to mention not everything is in the handbook. And sometimes you have to go to the uh, notary newsletter that is uh, published by the Secretary of State. It's on their website every January. Not only do they talk about new law changes to help you understand that, but they also talk about where the law is vague uh, and how it is expected for us to carry out that responsibility. So if you're in California, make sure that besides your handbook, you also have your notary newsletter from the Secretary of State. So these are the states where there's issues. And this is where we have to meet again. And yes, I have to redate it and create a new certificate. Let's talk about the ones that have provisions. If you're in Arizona, it tells you what to do. It says cross it out, initial, don't attempt to erase it or white out or anything like that. Um, Arkansas, uh, and what I've done is I've told you where I found the information. I'm not reading it, but that's what's on your screen. Um, only use an ink pen, strike an initial only. Person making the error corrects, um, which is understood to be that the notary is the only one who can make the correction to a notarial certificate. So never give permission or sign a document that says, yes, you can fix it for me. Colorado, um, again, you're gonna see this over and over, strike with ink pen, correct above or beside initial and date. I would say that is the most common instruction that I see in all the states. Uh, Idaho says any incorrect or omitted information may be subsequently corrected by the notary. However, you may not fix uh, your stamp or seal of office. And this doesn't come up very often, but we cannot color in the border or the seal or write over information from our seal. If the seal is not clear, you must uh, fix it a second time. You may not uh, fix a bad seal. Would that include? Indiana, I'm sorry, that, Bill. I'm sorry. Would that include when you accidentally stamp upside down? Uh, the law doesn't say it has to be right side up. So, um, although that would not be a best practice to leave it that way, best practice would be turn it around, sneer it, and do it again. If you didn't, you you, you actually perform technically the notarization and you have the seal of office. Right. Okay? It's when the seal is incomplete itself and not readable or the border has been infringed that there's an issue. Great. Indiana had a lot to say. They probably were the most verbose out of all the states. Um, you know, strike an ink, print the correction immediately above initial and date, record the changes in the journal. So I want to just point out that even if your law didn't say that and you maintain a journal, you want to go back and correct that journal and update it to reflect what's happened. Never send a completed certificate for somebody else to attach for you. So again, that means don't be sending a completed acknowledgement in the mail all by itself. You need that document for it to go together. And do not make the correction until you've confirmed from a journal entry that actually there was a mistake to begin with. And I have to say, I've had uh, signing companies or title companies tell me, oh, uh, you didn't send me the acknowledgement or the acknowledgement got ruined. I need you to send me another one. I go back to my journal and I performed a giraffe. It wasn't an acknowledgement to begin with. So now it's like, well, what's the story here? Are you talking about another document? Uh, and so then I have to go back and get clarification. I need you to show me what it is you have an issue with. Kansas, strike uh, incorrect information, print the correction, initial. Massachusetts, so only, again, that the notary has the authority uh, to correct it, strike correct initial and date. Don't send an unattached certificate without the document, except have an exception. The exception is if it's to an attorney, it's okay to do that. Although, I don't know about that myself. I cannot say I would put an attorney on a different level than a uh, title company, but there is the exception in Massachusetts. If your certificate is questioned, file an affidavit with the chancery clerk regarding the truth of the certificate for real property. Now, I think that's really interesting is if, if um, something's not clear in your certificate or you tried to fix it and now somebody's worried that it's been altered without approval, a notary can create an affidavit indicating that this is what the certificate was supposed to say and then have it filed uh, for real property. That's the only state I saw that in. 
Montana says, do not correct the image of your seal or stamp. So that was another state that uh, said that. May correct any information included or admitted from the certificate. So they're basically saying, look, you can fix this, just stay away from that stamp. North Dakota does not allow anybody except the notary to make the correction. So that's telling me it's okay to make the correction as long as it's the notary. Strike any pre-filled out information that's incorrect and initial. Oregon. So Oregon had a lot to say as well. You know, strike, correct, initial, and date. That is like the mantra, I think, for most states. No whiteout uh, or eraser tape or erasable ink. Don't be erasing it. A single strike so they can see what was underneath it and then initial it and make your correction. Reapply your stamp if it's smeared or unreadable. Record any changes in your journal. Don't send corrected certs to somebody else to attach. Confirm the correction with your journal entry. Corrections are made on an original certificate, not on a copy. So if they sent you a copy, don't be making those corrections on that. It needs to be on the original document. All right, I think I'm almost at the end. Utah. So only the notary can correct it, make the corrections on the original certificate only. Washington says notaries are allowed to make clerical changes only, and it goes on a little bit to talk about substantive changes are not allowed, only clerical. And then Wyoming, uh, in ink, strike, correct, initial date, only the notary may make the change. So these states specifically addressed it in the law and said, here's what we expect. So what about all those other states that didn't say anything? My state doesn't address it, what do I do? So then we're gonna recommend, if you call the hotline, here's what they're gonna say. They're gonna say, use the best practice. We believe the best practice is you're presented with the original certificate. You're gonna verify uh, with your journal entry to make sure it's the same document, same certificate. You will make the correction legibly and initial the correction and if needed, replace the certificate. If the journal is not in the notary's possession, the correction should not be made. If you can't verify it, then you should not be making that correction. And then no whiteout, correction tape, or any of those other methods. Uh, no obliteration of the uh, wording. Just a single strike uh, will do it. So in summary, look, don't obliterate, erase, or use whiteout. Use ink, strike, initial, and date. Only the notary should be touching a notary certificate, and it should be the same notary, not another notary in a title office. Um, don't give permission for somebody else. Sometimes I've seen documents that they want you to sign that says, I give permission for them to fix clerical items. No, they cannot be handling my certificate. Work only with the original certificate. Do not work with copies. Florida and California, just don't do it. <laughs> Renotarize instead. And there you go. There is your little five minute lesson on correcting notary certificates. Awesome, great information <clears throat> as usual, Laura, thank you. You're welcome. I love how you highlight to the uh, not to obliterate changes. And I think that's counterintuitive for a lot of people coming into the notary in, uh, industry. When they make a mistake, we just wanna scratch it out so people can't see it and make the correction. Right. And it just needs to be that single line strike through and the initial. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Now, here's a good question from Judy, and this is on my mind too. I wonder if you could maybe chat a little bit about this. What if it's a different date? Uh, and the, what is the impact on the date, especially in loan signings for some of these corrections? Well, the correction, if you're actually correcting the original certificate, you don't have to change the date. So then there wouldn't be an impact. Where the impact ha happens is in Florida and California. Right. These are the states that are going to have issues. You have to change the date because you're doing it again. And yes, that's going to have an impact. I don't know what the impact will be necessarily with that package. Uh, if they're going to have to do everything all over again, if they're going to accept it, I don't know what they're going to do. But really, that is not the notary's concern. I know it sounds heartless, even though it was your error. My concern is the integrity of the work that I'm doing and the fact that court system and other people are relying on the truthfulness and accuracy of that information. So that's what I'm held accountable, even though it's hard at the moment to do it. I love that. I think that's a critical part of integrity is knowing what you can and can not, mm -hmm. cannot do because you will be pressured 
especially with these correction situations, if you're in California and Florida, especially just knowing what you can and can't do. Awesome. And I have a, yeah. I'm sorry, I have I something I'd like to bring up if there's a second. Yeah. Carol, am I interrupting anybody? Yeah, just let me just complete that thought that Bill started. And then sure. you're, I'm happy for you to jump in. I, okay. I want to say when you hear a signing company say notaries do it all the time. Well, in 48 states they do. So that's right. They're not lying to you. They're telling you the truth. Notaries do make corrections all the time. But you happen to be in a state, Florida or California, that doesn't allow for it. And they may not understand that. That's what I wanted to add. Love it. Great clarity. Carol? Yeah, I wanted to bring up something that I've noticed happening a lot, and this is how I handle it with my students. Uh, let's presume that you have a split signing, mm -hmm. and uh, you are the second notary. You get a set of documents back, and all of the notarial certificates on the documents themselves, which the first notary has used, has not uh, does not cross out the name. They have not crossed off the name of the person who did not appear before them. So you look at this notarial certificate and you're looking at the name of the person that they, the other notary notarized, and you're looking at the name of the person that you're going to be notarized. Well, I wanna bring up the importance of when you do this, you absolutely must put a line through the name of the person that is not appearing before you. And what I tell my students is that if they get documents in this condition, they need to call title company. They need to reach out to somebody immediately. Don't wait until they get these documents back and see this uh, extra name on the notarial certificates. You need to reach out to somebody and tell them. You're not, you're not being a bully and telling on somebody else, but this could cause somebody's loan not to fund uh, if there's a process of getting new certificates and and all of this so i want to just bring that up because we all end up doing split signings at one point or another be careful when you get those from the other notary make sure that they have lined out the name of the person that's appearing before you and carol i have done those and it did happen where the notary did not modify they didn't do anything they didn't fill in names they just stamped and signed the certificate, I hate to say it was in Southern California, so guess what, that's not a good certificate. I took care of my certificate and only named my person, but I immediately called title to say, look, I can't fix it for this notary. I know I'm a notary, but I cannot fix it for the previous notary. I'm gonna take care of my business, I'm sending it back to you, title, and you need to get with that first notary to take care of it. So yes, it, it does happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen it a number of times. Wonderful topic. Laura, thank you for bringing that up. Carol, thanks for sharing that insight on the split signings too. That happens all the time. Let's jump into our questions now. Okay. Guys, uh, last week I did not ask for live questions, so I'd like to do that now. Is there anybody on the call with a burning question? You can click the button that raises your hand. You can type it into the chat window. You can private message me. You can unmute and speak. All right, Harold has one. Harold, jump in. Yeah, this I saw online this morning, and uh, I kind of knew the answer, but I figured I'd ask here since you guys were here. <laughs> and that is at the bottom of a um, at the bottom of a page, it just says ITS with an <laughs> underline. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, I saw that too. <laughs> okay, obviously we're on the same uh, website, we're on the same group in Facebook. <laughs> it says ITS. Is that for, for initials? Do you leave that blank? Do you have them sign that? What do you do with that? Initials. That's what I thought. Craziest way I ever saw it written, but it's ITS, little tiny line, perfect yes. for initials. <laughs> okay. It just made sense. It's at the bottom and it's only one a small line. Okay. And it's not like it's a title of an officer of a corporation or something where it's, it's vice president. No, no. It was right. initials. Yeah. Okay. That's Interesting. what I thought. I've heard that uh, a, a few other ways too. Laura, do you have uh, any, have you seen that at all? You know, I've seen it with a signature line. Um, and so I know that I'm not supposed to be messing with that document when I see that the signature line, it's a document that's not meant for the borrower. So I've not had to do anything with it. And I've never had a rejection. 
So I've not seen it like this has been, like Harold described it, that it was a, a very short little line at the very bottom for initials. I haven't seen that. I mean, I guess uh, ITS would be an abbreviation of initials in somebody's mind. <laughs> yeah, initial, that, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking uh, when I first saw it. <clears throat> Because it was in a, it was, I forgot which document it was, but it was a num on a number of pages in that document in the entire stack. Ah, okay. So, so I knew that it was initials because in another document, it had a line at the bottom in the same place, but without the ITS. <laughs> so I figured I'd just get the official from the three gurus. <laughs> Interesting. Hey, I'm guessing like the rest of us, okay? I'll be honest with you, because I looked at that and I, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I it see. just made sense. Yeah. I have a question. Bill, I have a question. It's Kelly. Hey, Kelly. How's it going? Yes, please. Good, thanks. Great talk. So here's my question regarding a new post. So a, a borrower, for example, a client has to sign their uh, signature exactly as it appears on the uh, loan docs or whatever. The question is, is that so if it's if they're if it's printed Sally Smith? Hey Kelly, can I ask you? Can I stop you real quick? I'm so sorry. It sounds like uh, you've got this running in the background. Uh, can you oh. can you mute the volume on the computer screen or something so we can hear you? Oh. <laughs> sorry, there's a lot of feedback. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. Let's see. I'll take this. Is that better? Yeah, it seems like it is. Okay, good. Well, now I can't hear you very well, but that's okay. Oh, we got feedback again. <laughs> that's all right. Just go ahead and ask your question. We'll, we'll make it work. Okay. So the question is, somebody has a name. So it's their, their name is Bill Sirocco on the loan docs. And then the, your initial is actually Bill K. Sirocco. So you, your initial is BKS. Is that all right? Or do you have to have your initial with BBS? So good question. Carol, you want to take that one? If somebody is signed. Okay, so the name on the documents is. Okay, so the documents on the, on the, I mean, the name on the documents is Bill Sirocco. And they're asking you to put your initials BS. But they wrote BCS, for example. So if over signing on initials is typically okay. If their normal initialing is BKS or whatever it is, that's typically acceptable. Undersign but not required. Undersigning is, would not be. Oh. Okay, great. But, but it's Got not it. required. Right. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Um, okay, so we've got some good questions that are coming in, in the private chat here, too. I want to make sure we get this one. Um, and I know um, this will be for both Carol and Laura, <laughs> and me, maybe we could even answer, um, what to do when you're ready to go escrow direct. Any suggestions for somebody who is about to make that transition? You're the, you're the direct guru. Yeah. <laughs> you answer it. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not going to get away with this. <laughs> oh, I, lo I love talking this part. This is my favorite business. But uh, actually, April's in my course. She specifically has gone through my material, and she'd like some additional perspective. So I'd like, if you don't mind. Um, just well, for me, off. I'll just say it takes time. Uh, I've never been somebody that was able to just march into an office and, you know, escrow or title even though uh, it, because of my background, it doesn't matter. But no, it, it took me a long time to develop relationships with people. And once I did, I was in, I was good to go. And, and that's what I tell my students. Once you do enough signings, either direct or through a, a signing service, and you do them error free and you, and you build a relationship with people. Um, you know, in fact, right now I, I, one of my, one of the companies on our list, uh, they're putting people through a 10, a 10 signing thing where they'll give them like one a month or one every two weeks. And then once they do 10 signings, I've got students that are getting 20 signings a week from this company. I mean, they, they move right up to the top once you pass that barrier. So it's got to be the same thing with the, when you're working direct with title or escrow, show them what you can do for them and, 
And Bill, you're, you're really good. You know how to do this better than anybody. Yeah, so time really does play a, a role in it. Um, so it's, it all goes back to relationships. And everybody, I, I think, um, new people want to skip the relationship part. They just want to jump in and just get business and start making money. But relationships take time. It's just like cultivating uh, a dating relationship or a friend relationship. That stuff takes time to establish this trust and what you can do. And the more creative and more authentic you can be when you do it, the faster it actually happens. Um, so all of the stuff that we talk about uh, in my course in Sign and Thrive, we have the Morning Mastery Program, we have the top of the top of mind, the daily dues, the stuff that you do every single day to keep yourself top of, top of mind and stay connected with people. Um, and we talk about this in Building Authentic Relationships too. Um, a lot of times we're only at communicating with people when we want something. And when we do that, it diminishes, it makes it harder to build trust in relationships when the only time you're reaching out is when you want something. Mm -hmm. So spend your time being genuine, reaching out to people, letting people know that you're available, finding out what's going on with them. How can you support them in, in their business? And another huge factor guys is it doesn't take 50 escrow officers. I made the most money of my life as a single signing agent. I had two escrow officer clients and two signing companies that I worked for. And that's all I needed. They happened to be really good and we had a, a relationship where they knew they could count on. That's really all it took. It's not, it's not this scientific formula. There's no magic formula. There's no magic potion that you can take. It's a matter of putting yourself out there, getting in the arena, Following the system that we all, you know, Carol has her system. That's not that far off from my system. Laura has her system. We're all teaching the same thing. It's staying connected. It's being authentic, doing this job for the right reason. But you've got to put yourself out there. And when you do that, when you get out in the arena, that's when the, the intersections of the people and the opportunities occur so you can get more business. It, one person changes everything in this business. Yeah. One of the things that I've, I've talked about, we've talked about uh, here, that is so very important when you're a new signing agent, especially, um, I talk to almost every one of my students right before they walk into the door. And, and we've talked about it several times, and I want to just reiterate the most important thing you can do. And since I started doing this and telling my students to, to do this, every student laughs when, they, when I ask them if they knew this was their first signing. And they say, no, I'm halfway through and they want to know how many I do a week. And that is when you walk into a person's home, you walk in confident with a smile on your face. And you, well, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And you be yourself. And that spreads through everything that you do in this community. Just be yourself. People know. They know when you're not there because of a good reason and because you are being somebody you're not. Absolutely, that authenticity means so much. Uh, and then we've got, it looks like Carrie has a question on the um, Notary to Pro Spanish. Carrie, do you wanna unmute and ask? It's either for either Lalo or Carol. It, it doesn't matter. Can Hi, you guys Carrie. hear me? Yep, okay. sure can. Um, so for the, um, and I didn't catch all of what he had, um, um, had said, but I, I did catch kind of sort of the glossary part of it or the part where um, uh, you, you, like for certain words you had different um, uh, a bunch of different uh, definitions for certain words. Is that right? So I had asked if, if, um, if my question is do you have uh, or do you offer a glossary um, for those particular words like part of you know of the of the course? So for example Example, um, plata in Spanish means money, but it can also mean silver. So, um, and Lalo knows what I'm talking about and those that speak Spanish. So do you have those definitions like in the course, like towards the end or somewhere they can download? Either Carol or Lalo. Lalo, you go ahead, are you unmuted? Yeah, I am. <clears throat> that is actually being compiled if, uh... Um, what I do is I put out a question every week on, on Facebook 
and say, how do you say this term in Spanish in your part of the country? And I get a lot of, a lot of oh, feedback. Oh, okay. So as I get that, I'm compiling this list. Now, not a bad idea, but what you just put out there, you know, we can put that list as it grows on mm -hmm. Spanish website so that you can refer to it. And I'll see if we can also have a request. In case you have a, a word that you'd like to have, have some, you know, translations for, we, we can add that to it. Are you using our glossary as a basic, uh, as the basic mm -hmm. basis for this, Lalo, the glossary yeah. that I have? Yeah, the glossary the that's in English, it, it is being translated and that will be on there. Wonderful. Yes. Cool. That's all. Thank Great you. question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rosemary says, sometimes the CD, which is the closing disclosure, and the settlement statement don't actually have the same figures. Are the final figures the settlement sheet or the closing disclosure? It's hard to explain to the borrower if there's a big difference. Laura, have you run into this? I have, and you know what? I'm gonna tell you, I, I think it's the closing disclosure myself. That's the one they should have seen three days in front. So that's what I think, but I don't know that I'm correct. So I'm going to let somebody else address it. For me, I, I'll i know if, a, if I see there's a difference in the numbers, I actually reach out to the escrow officer and I say, what's, what's, what, what gives, what's the deal here? And they'll tell me, this is a, usually this is what I hear. This lender does not, um, oh, they don't balance until the loan actually closes. So title, the title officer or the title company actually creates the settlement statements. So they usually have up-to-date property, uh, property taxes and things like that. Um, then the, the lender's closing disclosure might be off a little bit. So I'll just explain that and I'll ask for the final numbers and ask if the borrower has been made aware of the final cash to close and just get the clarity that way. Carol, have you explained, or have you run into anything different? Oh. I, I, I have through my students and I advise them to call title yeah. and get it straightened out because I know that as an escrow manager, officer, manager years ago, my figures oftentimes disagreed with what the title had to say because escrow has the final figures we have all those bills that are submitted into escrow you know when you get your taxes and all of this other stuff uh so oftentimes our uh title our settlement statements were the final thing but they would still get something from title and it would be very confusing and i have students that call me about this all the time and if there's a, any kind of a real difference between those figures more than a dollar or two I tell them call find out which one is because that's confusing for everybody and it's not fair yeah and i think it's totally I'm, I'm glad you brought this question up because it's totally legit to call the escrow officer and ask for clarification on that i think you know when we're just starting out we want to be real self-reliant and we want to be able to get these signings done but this is one of those times when it's totally okay to call and get the clarity on that Let's see. Um, anybody else have a live question? I'll ask Fernando's here in the meantime. Uh, my question's on mileage. If your state lets you charge a mileage fee, but you also deduct mileage on your taxes, isn't that considered double dipping or are there two separate transaction types? I don't want to get myself in trouble with Uncle Sam. I think uh, probably our, our staple answer here is you'll have to talk to your tax advisor on that one, right? Yeah. But your, if your state allows for you to charge for mileage, then you'd absolutely charge it. And then if, if you can deduct your mileage to talk to your tax advisor, just talk about, but I don't, I'm not, may not be quite understanding that. All right, let's jump into the presentation here because we've got some great questions that were already submitted. So I want to make sure that we, we get some of these going. I'm going to, I, I hear, sorry, Carol, I muted you. Just unmute when you're ready to talk. I can hear you fast typing. All right, here we go. 
All right, from Desire, can I really make money as a notary in New York, given the fact that it is an attorney state? Carol, you wanna have the attorney state conversation real quick? Oh, sorry, I have you muted. Let me unmute you, there you go. Okay, yeah, first of all, New York's getting busy, so hang on. Uh, and the, the uh, stu students that we have all over the country who are in attorney states, it is not bothering them one bit. Uh, you can handle, and this is what I tell people because they, they think that they, they'll like, they'll ask if I have companies on my list that are local to them. It's not where the lender is. It is not where the title company is. It's not where the escrow company is. It is where the people are because it's also not where the property is. We live in some, such a transient country. People are always moving around. And all you need to do is worry about getting uh, property, I mean, people that are near you, it doesn't matter if the property, where the property is. So people that are in Georgia, and I think it's South Carolina, they're doing great. And we have some people in New York and they're making good money. You just need to know how to reach out to those companies that are doing uh, the work. So it's where the people are. If you've got people living in your area that are refinancing a home or selling a home in any other state, you can handle that without a problem. Yeah, and you know, the other thing about this too, and it's all, every state is subject to interpretation. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not giving advice, but the, in most of these attorney states, the law just says that an attorney must be present or involved or involved in the closing of a real estate transaction and how that's interpreted in each state is very different. The attorney doesn't necessarily have to be sitting at the closing table, especially for refinances. They just have to be involved in the transaction. They're the ones that are uh, fiscally responsible for the closing of that loan. So what that involvement is to the definition of the law is interpreted on their end. And then they still, they're, the, the attorney kind of fulfills the same role as an escrow officer in some of the Western states. So they still hire independent contractors to go out and collect signatures. And when it, we really boil down to what we do, it's the collection of those signatures on behalf of another party. So it's been working out in all 50 states right now. I know South Carolina is the most strict of all of those states, but in Georgia, flying high, New York, a lot of those other uh, attorney states is going really well. Laura, anything to add on that one? I think you guys nailed it. Beautiful. From Justin, my signings take an average of one hour at the table with many running an hour and a half or longer sometimes. Wow. Eventually, this is going to hurt my ability to grow my business. What can I do to speed up a signing? Um, I'll jump in here first because this is really what I kind of credit my ability to really maximize my income. Uh, is I came up with a system and a script for every single document and every single signing. So I do every single signing the exact same way and that really helped me optimize my day it took a little bit of time to create it but once i got it i was able to really get efficient at this what do you guys do well i first of all learned a lesson many many years ago when i first started doing uh, the mobile notary signings and that was i would bring the package exactly as it was sent to me and i would start to go through and you know just tell them exactly, not exactly, don't read it or anything, but you know, this is the insurance, it says that you have to have homeowner's insurance. And I'd get through one or two pages and then, and then they'd say, well, how much is my loan? <laughs> okay, thumb, 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 get to the note, here's your loan amount, go back to the beginning, how much is my interest rate? Thumb, 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 thumb. It didn't take me very long to figure out that we can move documents around and put a few of the critical documents at the top you just slip a note in a little sticky note where it goes. If you take the note out or the CD or whatever and put it in there so you know where it goes when you're finished. And by doing that, uh, and I think you've said it before too because I tell people this, if, if you can answer the questions before they ask them and you can get to the things that they really care about, the money in, the money out, that's what, that's what most people want to know. Then you can go through the other documents really quickly, as long as when you hand it to them, you really tell them what it is, like the insurance. This just says basically that you understand you have to carry homeowner's insurance. And, or this one says, you know, something with the, that you have to do to the lender. 
you can get through these packages. We got it down to, except for the visiting, which I always used to do and love. Uh, we, we used to be able to get through in 40, 45 minutes with almost every signing. Every once in a while, you're going to be dealing with a situation where people, they're just going to take a lot longer. But I would say 45 minutes once you get practice should be the goal. Yep, totally agree. And the, that part of that script that I just mentioned is exactly what Carol's talking about. My script, in, it preempts, it, number one, it sets expectations in the very beginning of what I'm there to do and what freedom they have to slow down and read things or whatever and how boilerplate this this actual process is. And then the script with each document answers what's on the top of their mind. And it's the money in, it's money out. It's whether or not there's a prepayment penalty. Where, do, How do they make their first payment? All of those things. Laura, what about you? Anything to add on that? I think one, just what Carol said, I start always with the closing disclosure, wherever it is, I find it, put it on top because that's what they're interested in. And it pretty much answers uh, most of the money questions, which are the most important. The second thing is what you said, and that is I have an introduction, introduction script that I run through so they understand what I can do, what I can't do, and what's going to happen and what they're supposed to do. Um, and then the third thing uh, also you mentioned, which is, I have a prepared script to introduce each document in a in their language, in a language they can understand. I don't try to be uh, give the legal dis legal descriptions of these documents. So I give usually very brief, sometimes corny or funny ways to present it, so that they're like, "Oh yeah, okay," um, and they're willing to move on. And I think finally, it's so important that you be willing to be in charge. You know, we're so worried about the client being happy with us, but I think they're most happy with us because they don't know what they're doing, is that we demonstrate we know what we're doing and we're confident in that. And so they ride our confidence and they move right through it. Yeah. Oh, and everybody works at my table. Nobody gets to sit on their hands. If I'm working, they're working. So when they're looking at a document, I'm entering stuff in the journal. So I think that's the other thing is that if you're sitting in between documents, not doing anything, you're wasting time. Love that. And uh, there's lots of comments in here coming in about, you know, being chatty and really enjoying the connection with the borrowers. And I think that's so critical. And that's really, that's kind of the best part of our job is the people that we get to meet and being able to interact and build, lay the foundation to a relationship. The rule is, though, if you're talking, you're signing. You know, those papers have got, you've got to be moving paper across the table nonstop. There's none of the stop and chit chat and make eye contact. You're there for a specific job. So you really got to make sure the flow is there. You got to multitask that part of it for sure. One of the things that I've been uh, talking to my, my students about when they get their first signings is before they ever get to the signing, I want them to stop and think about how they are going to be the most comfortable sitting at a table. And now square tables and round tables are no problem, but you've got a rectangle table. Do you want to sit at the end, the short end of it, and have one or two people to your right? Do you want to sit across from the table? Are you right-handed, left-handed? So they know before they ever walk into that first signing how they are going to start handing those documents around. What do they want people to do when they're finished? If you've got two signers, does the second signer turn the documents over upside down in front of them? Or they hand them back to you. It's that kind of thing. Knowing that what you're going to do ahead of time will take time off of that, that signing. Yeah, and there's only so much that you that we can control, right? You know, we just have to get really efficient, make the signing as smooth and efficient as we can. And then there is the people factor that changes everything. So they may slow down and read things. They might chat back and forth with you. They might get distracted and have kids or pets or meals that they're cooking. It could be any number of things, but all we can do is control what we can control and then go from there. Great suggestions. All right, from Scott, is it the notary's legal responsibility or the signers to make sure that the, Just hold on. Sorry. Is it the notary's legal responsibility or the signers to make sure that the signing witnesses for documents that require it meet the specific requirements such as minimum age requirements, impartiality, and or unable to be a relative? Laura, can you chime in on this one? I'm sorry. I was making a note, so I didn't catch the whole question. Legal responsibility. 
for determining whether or not a witness is legally valid, basically. Is it the notary's responsibility or the signer's responsibility? Well, if I have instructions that tell me um, that they can't be a relative or they need to be at least 18 or any of those, of course, I need to communicate that. That's part of my job when I let them know they have to provide the witness. And by the way, make sure it's not a relative. So a lot of times I get instructions. If I don't get any instructions and they ask me, this is a document witness only, I'm assuming that's what they're talking about in this question, then that can pretty much be anybody not involved because the, a witness needs to always be impartial. That's the big deal. Uh, so if I'm the one that is conducting a signing, then I need to make sure all aspects of that signing when I'm there is working. So I do feel a responsibility to uh, communicate whatever requirements have been communicated to me. I don't think signers know of their own accord unless they've been told, maybe by their title company, maybe by their lender. But most likely they don't get told anything. Yeah. Yeah. Can I jump in on that one real quick? Sure. Um, I did a signing the other day with property that was in Florida and when uh, the signing service sent me the paperwork and everything and it said two nit witnesses required uh, and that the notary uh, can be one of those witnesses. Mm -hmm. I, I, I called them and said, I'm sorry, but I can't because I cannot witness my own signature. She says, well, I did six closings in Tennessee uh, yesterday and nobody had an issue of being a witness. I said, well, I will see if the borrowers can find their second witness. I mean, was I right or wrong? Or, I mean, I didn't think I could notarize my own Signature. <laughs> Here, is that Dita? That's Judy. Jo oh, Judy. I'm sorry. Well, we don't notar. I don't notarize the the witnesses. Right. You're only notarizing the signatures of uh, whoever's signing the document. So it's this. It doesn't matter. You're not notarizing your own signature. And if you're allowed to sign as a witness. Uh, in your state, then yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And there are some state specific laws on this. There are a few states that say no, may not be the witness and the notary. So make sure you know your own state laws. There are six different states that I know of that have witness requirements, although I cannot tell you by state what they are without looking at it myself. So if you want that, you want to know what your state requirement is, feel free to reach out to me. Most states don't address it. And so the rule of thumb would be, one, uh, best practice is that it be somebody else, not you. That's the best practice. Um, the other thing is, it doesn't matter what's allowed in the state where the documents are coming from. So maybe in Florida, one notary can be the witness, and that's fine uh, for Florida documents. But if the Florida documents are coming to a state where that's not okay for the notary, that notary has to follow their state requirements. Again, signing company may or may not know that it's okay in one state, but not okay in another. And the last thing is, is that if for any reason they did want those witnesses' signatures notarized, then obviously the notary could not be one of them. And Florida no longer requires witnesses on their security instruments. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Which was a big deal. I didn't know that until recently. I looked it up a couple weeks ago. This actually brings us right up to the nine o'clock hour. Perfect stopping point. The great question, Scott. Thanks for bringing that up. We've got a ton more questions for next week, guys. So looking forward to uh, having you on next week. Laura, thank you so much for the great presentation on correcting certificates today. That was great. Carol, thank you so much for all of your insight and wisdom onto the questions today. This was great. And Lalo, I'm, and I'm so excited for what Notary to Pro is doing for the Spanish speaking community. Thank you guys for joining us and growing yourself and your business on a Tuesday morning. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. It's 8 a.m. Pacific time. We use the same link every week. So if you put this into a calendar event on your own calendar of choice, you'll always be able to find us here. See you next week, guys.